Awesome. So our next session is titled Using AI to Make Decisions for the Right Reasons. It will be led by Yana Boyer. She is the head of quantitative portfolio solutions at Alphadine Asset Management. Prior to joining Alphadine in 2019, Yana held senior quantitative research and management roles at Citadel, BNP Paribas, and the IMB, sorry, the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Yana is the author of multiple peer-reviewed publications, patents, and the recipient of several awards for applied research delivered into products. She has a PhD in computer science and a master's of science degrees in computer science and mathematics. Please join me in welcoming Yana to the stage. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start with a disclaimer to say that um, everything that I say here today are my personal views and opinions, and they do not reflect those of my um, employer. And I was very happy earlier to see that uh, during the panel, we had such a, um, uh, an emphasis on explainable AI, because I'm here to talk about um, explainable AI, XAI. Um, and I would like to uh, continue to frame this conversation along the lines that we were, that, that we were discussed already. Um, basically, how do we expect ourselves to interact with our non-human uh, counterparts uh, to solve problems and especially to make decisions, uh, keeping in mind that ultimately we are the ones who are uh, being accountable for those decisions, but also keeping in mind that we shouldn't be too um, demanding uh, in the sense that um, we ourselves cannot always explain very well how we come up with certain solutions or, or certain um, decisions that we make. So this field of um, explainable uh, AI is evolving at the confluence of several disciplines. Um, obviously AI, uh, also human-computer interaction, uh, but more and more social sciences. So there has been a lot of research in uh, behavioral psychology and philosophy about how people come up with explanations and uh, what are good explanations versus bad explanations. And uh, these are being brought into the area of um, artificial intelligence and in, in particular of how, what type of explanations we should expect from these um, uh, non-human, uh, basically from the AI agents. And the other thing to think about here is why we need these explanations. So we are still at the, at the bottom of the pyramid as far as AI is concerned. We are in the space of the so-called narrow AI, where uh, these agents are, making, uh, are solving very specific tasks, being trained on very specific data. So the, um, this, uh, the, the fact is that they are not at our level of intelligence, right? So ultimately, the accountability in making decisions falls to us. So even if we had like a perfect, uh, a perfect algorithm that always was right, how many of us are comfortable uh, making a, an important decision, let's say a life and death decision, um, thinking just that it's, it's always right and not knowing exactly how it works, right? So we need some form of, of explanation. Now, in terms of how we interact with the machines, right, the machine learning has, has uh, brought about a big uh, paradigm shift uh, because we no longer just build the models ourselves and then implement them, but we're having this uh, different approach, right? It's very much like humans are learning in some sense that uh, we are just giving uh, a lot of data to the, to the machine, and then we are expecting it to come back with a model, and then we are using that model to uh, make decisions, right? So this is the uh, machine learning approach. And then a very successful class of, of algorithms within machine learning are these deep learning methods, um, and there's a lot of deep things flying around uh, these days as uh, this adjective gets tagged onto a lot of things. Uh, but they also get a bit of a bad, uh, name because they're associated with these black boxes, right? So, um, so these are usually um, highly um, nonlinear um, type of algorithms. There's a lot of parameters uh, in real applications. We can have, you know, hundreds of thousands of parameters or even millions of parameters. So we we know what the architecture is inside that black box, but we don't exactly know how one goes from the inputs to the outputs, how, how one goes from the, um, from the data to the, to the actual final decision, right? So uh, we have a bit of a, 
an Occam's dilemma as opposed to Occam's razor, right? Simple things are not necessarily better in this case, uh, rather the opposite. Uh, it seems like a lot of these um, complex, deep neural networks have a lot of su success, um, but then, you know, how do we go about understanding what exactly they do? And this is where explainable AI, as we've heard also from our panelists, comes in. Um, I use explainability and interpretability here in, in um, interchangeable ways uh, to signify that something is explainable or understandable to the uh, human, uh, to, to, a, to a human being. And we've already heard why is it so important, right? Trust in the first place, uh, but there are also areas where it's not necessarily that important, right? When, when the decisions are not big, like for example, you're being targeted for a marketing ad, you don't necessarily need to understand why you're being targeted if you don't care. Uh, but overall, I think there's a big push for us to understand for regulatory reasons, for trust reasons, fairness, privacy, to understand what are the, um, the reasons behind uh, the algorithms that we use. Now, I mentioned that in social sciences uh, has, has been a lot of research about what, is, what it means to, to come up with a good explanation. Um, right? So how do people come up with good explanations? And it turns out that there are certain um, subtle aspects about the whole process. There's been uh, Nobel Prize researchers who have looked into this, this topic. Uh, but I, I think there are a few that we can bring into artificial intelligence, such as you know, good explanations. We like the ones that are not necessarily absolute, but contrastive, right? We'd like to say, um, I chose, or the algorithm chose this particular um, outcome versus this other outcome because, and, and give a reason why, why it did that. We also like things to be fairly selective, so not too um, hairy explanations, right? Like if we have 15 different things that went into a decision, then maybe that's not as good as having one or two that are the main reasons why we're, uh, or the, the, the agent, the AI agent made that decision. Um, exception focused is a bit of a tricky one because it goes in direct contradiction with the following two. Uh, so let me explain that a little bit. So we like, or it seems like there's, there's uh, evidence out there that we seem to like things that highlight abnormalities. So if something that's highly improbable occurs and a decision is made because of that, we like that. But all else equal, so when these uh, abnormal events don't happen, then we like things to be generally applicable, very probable, and also we like them to be consistent with our intuition and our beliefs. And if you've had the opportunity to work with um, portfolio managers or to be one, uh, you know that it's, it's always um, about the gut feeling of the, uh, of the PM um, above all, above all the models and about, uh, above everything else because um, you know, it's good when the, the, when, when the models give non-intuitive answers, there's a tendency to, to ignore them or at least to, to not trust them as much. And there is a difference between good decisions and good explanations, right? So we talked about um, uh, the fact that we are the ones making uh, the, the ultimate decision. But if, even if we had this, this machine that always makes, makes the right decision, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's for the right reasons, right? So this, this is easier um, illustrated with an example from a computer vision algorithm. So it's a classification task. Um, and here in this, in this particular task, the algorithm is tasked with um, telling, or telling the difference or identifying, classifying images of fireboats and uh, streetcars, right? And um, if you've not seen, I highly recommend that you go see the work earlier this year that was published earlier in early 2019 um, by OpenAI and Google on um, uh, activation atlases, but basically the idea here is that um, people try to visualize, visualize what's going into the decision between uh, classifying something as a fireboat or classifying it as a streetcar. And we see in the first column, right to the left, that uh, fireboats seem to activate things that look like windows, and so do streetcars. So there are these activation visualizations or neurons in this deep neural network that does the decision. Uh, that seem to pick on things that look like windows in both cases, right? So that's not a distinguishing element. Then they both seem to pick up on things that looks like some, some sort of crane or some sort of device that has 
um, those uh, um, um, things coming out of it. Uh, and a little bit less in the case of the streetcar, but in, in both cases, they, they seem to be there. And now something interesting happened in the, in the third column. So you can see that for the fire boat, there's a lot of activations of things that look like water, right? So um, whereas that's not the case for the streetcar. And then vice versa, for the streetcars, there's a lot of activations of things that look like um, buildings, like architectural details, and not so much for the fire boat. So even though this engine makes the decision correctly that something is a, hire, a fire boat or a streetcar, it does it because it identifies things like water around the boat and uh, architecture around the streetcar, not necessarily because of the actual differences between the, the two objects. So it's more about the environment. And then this, this is a similar situation here. This is one of my favorite examples, right? You have this like um, ImageNet is this database of a lot of images. You have these uh, competitions, right? The, who comes up with the best algorithm to classify things in multiple classes? And it does really well, right? Like I'm personally not able to tell gray whales from uh, killer whales by looking at images like that, but the machine does. And so it's able to classify the gray whale with a, with a very high accuracy. But as soon as you add a baseball into the image, it thinks it's a shark. And it thinks it's a shark because of the stitching on the baseball, right? So the, if you think of the pattern of, of uh, those white, uh, those, those red lines on the white background is very similar to the shark teeth that are white um, on the red background of the, of the inner mouth, right? So it thinks it's a shark just because of that object is there. So now, um, when you uh, enlarge that image, then it correctly classifies it as a, as a baseball. So the idea here is that um, just because something is, is classified uh, well doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good explanation as to why it's, it's, done, it's taken that decision. So now in terms of explanations and uh, explainable AI, there's a lot of methods, right? So uh, how do we classify them, how we think about them. So one way to think about it is what are we trying to explain versus, uh, so what are we trying to explain, but in, in terms of like how, if, if a particular neural network does something, what is it exactly that it does as opposed to how it does it, how it goes from um, the inputs to the outputs. The other type of explanation is are we trying to explain the data or are we trying to explain the models? Um, and we'll have some examples of that. And then um, another way to look at explanations are if they are local or global. So a local explanation might be something related to a particular instance. So for example, let's say you predict that a particular uh, price is going up tomorrow uh, based on some uh, market uh, state of today. Um, well, that's a local explanation. Whereas you could have a different explanation saying this particular algorithm typically predicts uh, that the, this particular price would go up in a set of market conditions. That's a global explanation. And then we have also this um, uh, difference between intrinsic and post hoc explanations. So uh, a lot of algorithms today, they just do things and then we're trying to explain why they did that. So those are post hoc explanations. But the research now in explainable AI is going deeper into the area of intrinsic explanations. In other words, building the, the explanation as part of the algorithm as it progresses and as it does the learning. All right, so here's some example, the what versus the how or why, right? So this was one of the first things that were done with neural networks was to see what exactly they are visualizing. And people saw that, for example, um, the, the first layer in a, in a deep neural networks, they pick up on very um, uh, salient features like edges. Then the next layers are picking up like uh, collections of edges that form contours. Then those contours are grouped in higher and higher levels of abstraction. Um, not necessarily the same type of ab abstractions that we would do, like when we look at a human face, let's say. Um, we see eyes and nose and things that are meaningful to us. Uh, the computer does find structure, but not necessarily the, the same structure that we would find. Um, and then the other type of um, ex explanation is when the computer or the algorithm is really telling us how or why it, um, uh, it came up with a particular answer that it did. 
And that's known as attribution. And so how do we go, you know, how do, who do, how do the neurons interact to learn something? How do we go from the input to the output? There is also the issue that I mentioned before of are we trying to explain the data or are we trying to explain the model? And so this goes back to where is really the boundary between um, us pre-processing the data and uh, the machine starting to learn. We said before that the uh, machine learning is this paradigm where we give the computer a lot of data and then it, it comes up with the model. But the question is, you know, what kind of data do we give it? Do we give it very complex things after we've processed them a lot and then the, the computer can come up with a very simple model? Or do we just give it raw data and let it find uh, the features of interest and learn the um, the function that it's trying to learn and come up with the output. So in one case, the model can be very simple and the other uh, very complex, but then the complexity in the first case shifts into the, into the uh, feature engineering side. And uh, I have an example of that here. So this is an example taken from uh, work that was looking to find good predictors of closing prices on the Stockholm uh, Stock Exchange. So for, uh, and you, we can see here two of the seven models that the people came up with in, in that particular piece of work. And we see here that this model is actually very simple. It's, it's uh, multivariate linear regression. Now, the fact that they had to come up with seven things already tells us that perhaps none of them is, is quite there in terms of explanatory power, but there's also the issue of, you know, what kind of features go into these closing price predictions. And if you look at the uh, bottom model, you see that there were certain explanatory variables that are added, like positive press, negative press. Well, coming up with what does it mean for something to be positive press, that's actually quite a complex algorithm in itself, right? How do you come up with that score? Um, how do you come up with a model as you know, the sentiment in, in press? What type of data do you use for, for evaluating that? So, so these are all um, features that go into a very simple model, but the, uh, uh, the features themselves are, are quite complex. So then what do we, do we say, right? When we talk to people and we say, well, linear regression is highly interpretable, um, that's true because of you know, all the reasons that uh, you see listed there, people like it because it's intuitive and things are additive and we can do feature attributions easily. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the um, explanatory power or the, the explanation quality is uh, very high. So in terms of the um, features of explanations that we talked about earlier, uh, well, are linear regressions contrastive? Um, they are, usually with a reference that means that you keep one, everything constant and only one thing moving, right? Which in finance, we know that that's not usually the case. Um, they're not particularly selective, at least not with additional work. So if we go back to this, um, to this chart here, we see that in the first model, there are about 17 um, variables there and in the second, 24. So it's not um, intrinsically selective unless we add some, some sparsity constraints. Uh, it's very consistent with our ways of checking things and the mental checks that we do, so that's the nice thing about it. And it can be very general, but not necessarily simple. Right, so something to, to think about when we talk about explainability and linear regression. Now for the next um, examples, I'm going to uh, uses illustration, this idea of learning complex financial functions using machine learning methods. And I chose this example because there's a lot of papers, a, a flurry of uh, papers actually lately, that um, try to use machine learning and finance <coughs> for learning various things. We had one this morning, um, but in general, people talk about trading signals as functions and portfolio uh, PV and risks as functions and stochastic volatility models, uh, you know, Saber in particular, that's, uh, or we've seen um, um, others like Hal White and uh, others that are being um, used, for, for which we're using um, uh, machine learning methods to learn the functions that otherwise we would be approximated by some, some formulas that 
presumably are more expensive to compute. So once you have these models, the idea is that, and it's very efficient to use them as um, you know, just a new sample uh, is evaluated by simple function evaluation, right? So under what circumstances can we base our decisions on functions learned with these type of um, neural networks? So I'm going to start with a very, very simple portfolios. We just have two calls with, uh, you know, each with a forward and a strike, a maturity and uh, its volatility. And um, we see that even if we just talk about the forwards and the vols, we're already in four dimensional space. Of course, this is a, a toy example, so the, the real life examples are much, much higher dimensional. But we're already having an issue just like thinking about uh, you know, what this surface looks like in 4D. So I represented this here in, in three dimension, right? It's all I can, I can do on this particular um, you know, flat uh, slide. So I have the two forwards and one volatility, which is kind of looking at the diagonal of that um, hypercube in, in 4D. Um, but I'm going to actually, in the next slide, make it even simpler, right? In the sense that I'm going to just, you know, think of this portfolio of just like two uh, calls on the same underlying, so basically a call spread. Think of it as a digital option or think of it as a call spread, so a single trade, um, rates and vol. So one rate, one vol, lowercase f and lowercase s. Um, and the first prediction uh, model that I will use is just one that's very familiar to us, which is the prediction using Greeks, right? Um, so we are going to predict the PV of the portfolio uh, using first and second order Greeks. Uh, this is very commonly done for options portfolios. And we can see here that the approximating surface, which is the blue surface, the black one is the, the actual surface, um, is a good approximation locally, which is what we expect from, from Taylor series, right? Uh, but it's actually quite bad uh, away from, from where you know, the, the base of the, uh, the, the base uh, PV, let's say, where it's that red point. I don't know if you, you can actually see it. So I, I chose three different configurations. So when you are in the flat regions of that call spread, it's kind of harder to predict um, when market moves are, are bigger. And then in the middle, there's a bit of a, a flattish area there where you have a bit more uh, leeway in terms of good approximation qualities. But overall, it's, if you think of it as a global um, approximation, it's, it's not that good, right? Um, but we use it even when markets move a lot because it's something that's, um, that satisfies a lot of these attributes. Again, um, it's intuitive. It has nice additive uh, features, uh, uh, attribution, and so on. Um, and more important than anything, it's consistent with our beliefs, right? And it's also something that we're used to using or doing this back of the envelope calculations. And again, um, it's simple, but not necessarily a global representation or not necessarily general. Uh, but let's see now, imagine we're trying to replace that. Uh, we say, well, it has some drawbacks. Let's replace this with a uh, neural net, right? So neural net will learn this function and we're going to present it as, a, as an alternative. Well, in this case, I'm using a very simple neural net, uh, just 10 neurons, and uh, it's, a, it's a radial basis uh, um, layer followed by a linear layer for those of you who are curious about the, the architecture there. And what we see is that we get very good predictions around where the training data is, but overall it's a pretty bad um, function learner, right? And so now the question is, what do we do? Throw more data at it? Well, it becomes a little better just in the sense that there's more data, so more training points. So closer to those more training points, it, it gets better. Um, so here I have 100 nodes in that first layer. Um, but still a pretty bad approximation, right? So now what else can we do with the neural net to make it better? Well, neural nets have uh, parameters, right? So now we can start fiddling with parameters. Um, in this case, because I use Gaussian radial basis functions, there's this notion of a spread of, a, of the Gaussian, so we can fiddle with that. We can also work with the activation constraints or the neuron type itself. We could replace the Gaussian with something else. Uh, but for, for now, let's just play with the spread. So now 
you know, like larger and larger spreads result in smoother and smoother approximations, uh, but at the cost of maybe not being as good approximators to the initial training data that as, as uh, we originally started with. And we can enforce constraints around those points. So we, we can say, well, we want them to be very well approximated, but still away from the data, uh, we don't have a good intuition as to what might happen in those regions. And keep in mind that this is two-dimensional space, right? So when we're talking about high-dimensional spaces, everything is sparse, even with a lot, a lot of data. Um, so when we're trying to replace our Greek approach with, with this kind of network, well, the intuition plays a big role, right? Because we don't know these kind of oscillations are not, are not uh, things that we want to see in our financial functions that we're learning. So this type of network may not be as good as explaining, even as, as the other approach that had already limitations, right? So shall we make it a little bit more complicated? Let's say we try to use a deep neural net. Now here we have a lot of choice to do, right, to, to, to make. Uh, we can have 10 layers, we can have three layers, we can choose how many neurons to have in each of the layers. So these are all uh, things that we can control. But ultimately, the, the more complex we make this learner, uh, the worse, I guess, the approximation becomes unless we start throwing more and more data at it. So here I have two examples. So the first example, if you didn't see it, it was just 10 neurons in each. So it's you know an order of hundreds of parameters. If we're talking about this one, thousands of parameters. So the approximation is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, but then the more data we put at it, then things become um, more useful, right? But the fact of the matter is, and what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, we could have these complex models that seem like very good at, at uh, classifying things properly or making the right uh, approximations to the functions, but we don't really know what happens in those high dimensional spaces. And um, having good explanations, or at least in this case, I had the visualization to to back me up, but then coming up with good explanations for this higher dimensional representation, representations is um, where the research lies in this explainable AI um, context. So we can try to view these explanations as actually new models that explain complex models, right? So simple models that explain um, complex models. And um, I think that's it. I put it here some references in case you're interested in, in looking more into the details. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Any questions? Yes, please. Do you think that it's possible to imagine that some of these machine learning systems uh, are actually impenetrable to our understanding? Yeah, I think that's, so the, the question is, do we um, think that um, some of these systems may be impenetrable to our understanding, uh, regardless of how much we try to, to explain it, right? And I, I do think um, that in, in a sense, that's the, the that Occam's dilemma that we try to, that I, I pointed out at the beginning, right? Like these are, very powerful techniques, um, and the idea is to go beyond our level of understanding and go beyond our level of, um, well, the computers are already beyond our level of computation, but now we're using these uh, new techniques and take advantage of all the computing power to come up with things that we couldn't do before, but now it's a matter of you know how much do we trust these things that we don't understand what they do. So I think it's possible to, and, and this whole presentation is about how do we balance between um, accepting that we won't necessarily understand everything with how much do we need to, to do we really need to understand in order to make this, uh, uh, you know, to be able to make the decisions that we're, we're making um, and to um, take the risks, basically. Because ultimately, when something happens, when the, you know, the self-driving cars kills a pedestrian, there has to be an accountability. And that accountability doesn't go to the machine. It goes to, to a human who 
and and the other the other question is do we you know do we always listen to these to these uh, suggestions that the machine is is the agent the intelligent agent is giving us or do we override it and uh, when do we override it we don't necessarily have to understand it fully but we have to try to come up with um, uh, models of you know what it means to um, to have trust and also what it means to um, be happy or satisfied with the explanation that it gives in the context that we are the ultimate decision makers. When they make the decisions for us, then it's, it's a different question, but we're not there yet. Yeah? Is there a good metric for how well a model is explainable or how well it's explainable? Um, well, there are some metrics, like there's information, if, in, sorry, information criteria, there's some um, you know, numerical ways of, of computing, um, ex, you know, uh, how much, like for example, in those linear regressions that I was showing, the way that uh, in the end, uh, the authors of the paper chose to use one model over another was the information criterion. But that's just one uh, way of doing things. Um, people are coming up with more metrics, but I have to say there's, there's a, um, a mixture of actual metrics and just things like visualization, you know, looking at, at things and, um, and being able, from a human perspective, to, to have some confidence that it doesn't do something crazy. So it's, it's more on the idea of dimensionality reduction to map it into a space that we can then reason about with our human minds. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yana. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause.